Hello, I'm Kara Krakus, here with Peter Raven at his home in St. Louis. In the years since I was his student, we meet regularly to discuss ideas and share thoughts about the world. Today we invite you to join us in this garden as we discuss conservation and our hopes for humanity. Hello, Peter. Hi. It's good to see you again. It's good to be here. So I know that we are discussing conservation today and we were talking about some of the ideas of when and how both of us first came to conservation. Well, you know, the old days, hundreds of years ago, uh, when people were worried more about wolves and bears and things like that disappearing, they didn't really have a conservation idea like we do now. The idea of conservation began to grow up around the 20s, 30s, 40s, when large stretches of forest were destroyed and it became obvious that not just wolves and bears, but a lot of other things were becoming extinct too. And we were basically starting to disturb the whole world in ways that we hadn't been used to before. So conservation really became an important thing at that level during my lifetime, really starting in the late 60s, we'll say, and then gathering speed from then until now over the following 50 years. Well, I know for myself, growing up in the 80s, um, a lot of those infrastructures were in place. <clears throat> the Clean Water Act, the Endangered Species Act, social events like Earth Day, which impacted the way I viewed the world. But it they, really- They were passed. They were passed after the action in conservation grew in the 60s. And so I, I was the beneficiary of, of, of those things. Um, but in terms of my own caring or, or experiencing wanting to focus on those things, I think it was as a, a young biology student, you know, you start to study the natural world and then you begin to love it and want to care for it. You face those some tough challenges with conservation going forward. Partly because the number of people in the world has grown so rapidly. When I was born in the 1930s, there, were about, there was about one person for, a, for nearly four now. In other words, the population has nearly quadrupled, grown between three and four times during my life. And during that time, uh, which is really the end of the growth since agriculture was invented about 11,000 years ago, the number of people in the world have begun to exert an intolerable, inexhaustible seemingly pressure on it and really to destroy whole ecosystems, whole groups of organisms, as well as individual kinds of organisms at a rate that the world hadn't seen for tens of millions of years. We really have become such a dangerously high consuming species. And it would do well that for us to remember that we are not separate from the ecosystem. We need it to stay in place for ourselves. Yeah, it's well worth consulting a website called the Global Footprint Network, which shows mm -hmm. how much we consume versus how much there is available. And for example, worldwide, we're consuming around 175% of what the natural productivity is. That natural productivity is all we've got. Sadly, the economic models we have show it being replenished along with labor and other commodities as we need more of it, but that just doesn't happen. We just dig deeper and deeper into it. The more people there are, the more our demands, the more we're destroying the earth, the more we're using up the earth's bank account, so to speak. When you consider that all our food comes from plants directly or indirectly, mm -hmm. and most else of what we use comes from natural systems in one way or another, the fact that we're using them at faster than they can be replenished is a very serious thing for our future and a very damaging thing to the world ecosystem. So with those dark numbers in front of us, what I find interesting is that both you and I are still optimists about what the future can hold for a sustainable world. And I wanted to talk a little bit about why we both still have so much hope for the future of our species and our planet. So um, why don't you talk a little bit about that? <laughs> There's no reason to have any hope at all. There's no reason to have any hope at all if we're not willing to do something. We can sit there forever being blithering optimists, but if we're not willing to do anything, it's unwarranted, we should be pessimists. One of the things that should give us hope is the lives of people like St. Francis or Nelson Mandela or Gandhi, for example, 
all of whom inspired millions of people uh, simultaneously and caused the kind of change in attitude that we're really going to need in order to be able to save the global sustainability. What if we had a world where we did not tolerate that one person uh, was suffering compared to another? We've got to find spiritual inspiration to get the love that we'll need to pull that off. But one of the things we can do is let our own children know about the world, send them out as often as we can, bring them out as often as we can, let them see countries like India and Indonesia and the poor countries of Africa, in addition to rich countries like France and England. Let them understand that most people in the world don't live in a way even remotely resembling what we do. And so if we want people to practice conservation, we can lecture a poor woman in West Africa all we want about not eating chimpanzees, but if she's starving to death and she has one, she's gonna feed it to her kids no matter what. She doesn't care what we think or what we might want. We're not running that conservation program in her country as a benefit to us. Well, that's such an important point to remember for first world nations to not um, put their the weight of their own goals on third world nations without empowering them economically, socially, and so forth to be able to make their own decisions in ways that are driven from their own choices. Religions can play an important part in inspiring people to do that because we've got to look way beyond the familiar into the unfamiliar. We've got to see people as all being human. We've got to value them and their potential as being human. And we've got to regard it seriously and constructively for all of our lives in order to bring the world together close enough to build sustainability. However, the great example of people like St. Francis or Nelson Mandela or Gandhi show us that people do have the ability to inspire all those levels. Even Pope, Pope Francis in his Laetato Si encyclical before the Paris Climate Agreement inspired people of all religions to think about the need of the world for acting which is far beyond the need for one country to be greedy. So in addition to social justice and the importance of that global perspective, I know we've also talked a lot about the importance of empowering women in conservation. There's hardly anything more important in terms of achieving a sustainable world when you consider that about a billion of the total eight billion people in the world are women who are absolutely unempowered and the children that are with them and unempowered means they have no say over their own destiny, and they also cannot contribute anything from their own intellect to the, embetter, to the betterment of their, of their populations, of their people. And it reminds me of the, of the original model of the United Negro College Fund, the mind is a terrible thing to waste. Consider the, the hundreds of millions of women and children in poorer countries who have absolutely nothing to say about their own lives, much less give us any advice for ours. So, Peter, you do practice what you preach. And I always love to point out what a marvelous feminist you are um, in empowering women. When I was your student, graduate student, I had two back-to-back -back baby girls. And rather than expressing concern or even support in the form of how are we going to make this work, you didn't do any of that. You said, congratulations and we sailed back into the science. And I love that because the message to me was, that's wonderful, your choices are great, and at no point do I question you making your own decisions. And I've always remembered that, what a true feminist you are, huh. that you do believe that women do know what is best for them. Well, I think even humanists respecting and honoring people for what they are, understanding what they are, and giving them a chance to show what they can do applies to everyone. Uh, like you, I believe in our species. I think that we are fundamentally good, as you said, and capable of being good mammals that care for ourselves, each other, and our planet. We're clever, that's for sure. <laughs> we have brains, we ought to use them. I think the future is bright uh, for conservation sustainability. I think it is a matter of will and choice um, for what we do with this gorgeous planet. You have a book on faith and science coming out soon, don't you? I do, a, a chapter I mean, in a that. A chapter in it, yes. yeah. And you have your autobiography coming out, Yeah. And uh, which I've read portions of, and I'm very excited for the rest of the world to, to read it. Um, and you and I have talked a lot about that balance between our 
uh, belief systems and how tightly they tie to our faith in humanity being able to build a sustainable world. And I know that uh, as we close out today, there was a line from a Welsh poet that you and I were discussing earlier. And um, I'll just recite those, those lines. The poem is called Islands. It says, I have not found them, the islands of peace, of the blessed, but believe in them, reach for them, keep them floating with my breath. It's a world worth working for. Thank you, Peter, for such a lovely afternoon. And thank you to everyone for spending some time with us. It's been great.